Hello again. Now our business and academics clients alike often find themselves in the need of a rigorous survey to measure constructs that they are interested in. And in consulting with our academic clients regarding statistics, it's often possible and always ideal to use a pre-validated survey instrument, something that already exists and has been tested for validity and reliability. That's because the work of validation can be difficult. When we work as consultants with our doctoral clients though, we often find that no pre-validated instrument exists. We're always happy to devise the survey, design the pilot testing needed to ensure validity and reliability, and then take on that statistical testing to make sure that the instrument is ready to go. For our business clients, operationalized constructs are often unique, while concerns such as customer need and satisfaction apply to most or all businesses. As an example, the way each looks for a particular company is quite different. Therefore, for this type of applications, ensuring that the survey used is valid and reliable is critical to guarantee that the findings of any statistical analysis are meaningful and provide actionable recommendations. Now we've worked with clients on a great many projects just like this. Some real examples from our actual clients include customer perceptions about product quality, employees' job satisfaction levels, and management style and effectiveness. Now, as I was saying, developing a reliable, statistically valid survey is critical to drawing accurate and powerful conclusions from analysis of data. Collecting data for analysis is a very costly and time-consuming endeavor. And this is true for our academic research clients, and more so for our business clients. Because it's so resource intensive for small and large businesses alike, it's vital to spend the necessary time with a statistician designing an appropriate survey instrument and making sure it will work properly. This should happen before the data collection process begins. And in this video, we'll talk a lot more about what makes an effective survey instrument, what principles underlie their construction, and hopefully demystify what can often be a really overwhelming process. Now, first, the most important factors in the effectiveness of a survey are those characteristics I mentioned before, validity, and reliability. When data analytics companies talk about validity and reliability, they're talking about two separate but connected constructs. Validity is about accuracy, measuring what you want to. So let's imagine that we want to measure customer satisfaction. The center of this target represents that construct. Now, picture each of the marks that I've drawn on the target as a survey and response from a participant, in this case, a customer of yours. Since surveys are really resource intensive, it's important to ensure that the survey measures satisfaction and not one or more constructs that might be related to satisfaction, but not exactly the same. It's natural at this stage to seek assistance from a statistical consultant to make sure you navigate this step successfully. In my example, you can see that the marks are generally not hitting the bullseye. This is a case in which the survey is not valid. On the other hand, you can see that all the marks are generally clustered around this one point, which brings us to the issue of reliability or precision. This survey is reliable though, because it's generally always producing the same or similar results. Unfortunately, it's reliably wrong. It gives precise information about a construct we're not interested in. Now let's consider another case. Now on average, these marks are clustered around the bullseye, meaning that this survey appears to be measuring customer satisfaction. It is a valid survey. However, even though the survey produces the desired result on average, it isn't reliable because it lacks precision the marks are too far apart from each other. Now you should be able to deduce the remaining two cases. This is an example of a non-valid, non-reliable survey. The marks are clustering around a different spot, not the bullseye, making the survey not valid. They're also far apart from each other, making it lack precision as in the previous case. It's therefore not reliable. Finally, this is a case of a valid, reliable survey. All responses are close to each other, making this survey precise. They're also hitting the bullseye, meaning that we are indeed measuring customer satisfaction. 
The main goal of this survey design is to ensure that your survey works as in this last example. We consult with clients with precisely this work every day, both as they look ahead to survey development and as they actually work to make their instrument successful for their statistical research needs. Please know that we're here to help with any issues you're encountering and that you can call us anytime. All of this implies that you're focusing on quantitative survey questions, but I'd be missing something if I didn't correct that. Surveys break down into two main types, qualitative and quantitative. We'll focus most of our time on quantitative here because these instruments produce the hard data that can help to drive your business decisions. Okay, let's get specific. Now here's a clear statistical example that reflects a need that we consult with businesses about often, which is market research. In market research, firms are looking ultimately for what helps increase sales. It's hopelessly complicated, and it's driven by a myriad of factors, from geography and clientele to overall market conditions and competitor level variables. Now, when companies seek out data analytics assistance, it's often to try and understand this complexity. We'll focus in here on one key factor in all market research, customer satisfaction. Again, this can be addressed qualitatively or quantitatively, and I'll describe here what qualitative surveys on satisfaction can address. Generally, qualitative surveys are applied through unstructured or semi-structured interviews or conversations with the participants. In this way, the interviewer might ask questions such as, what do you value most when deciding to buy this product? Why do you value quality over price? What do you think would make the product better? Through qualitative analysis, these types of questions can help to really focus on the subject responses that a customer has to the brand or to specific products or services. For this reason, the resulting data can be really rich, revealing the complexity behind the respondents' thoughts and the decisions that they make. However, this is best yielded through interviews, and those are incredibly difficult to get, and they result in a huge cost. And finally, because they're so expensive, they usually result in a really small sample size, and this can make the wider understanding that companies often need hard to obtain. A quantitative instrument is on the other side of the spectrum, and in ways that tends to make it ideal. First, it can't get at participants' uniquely subjective experiences the same way that qualitative data collection, especially interviews, can. Instead, surveys are really targeted in examining really specific factors that are specified a priori when planning the survey. There's a lot less flexibility in the way that questions are asked. For instance, since they're close-ended, typically scored in a five or seven point Likert scale, they move deductively, aiming at testing whether an established hypothesis is true or false. So while a qualitative survey might ask, what do you value most in the product? A quantitative one would ask, rate from one to five, how important the product quality is to you. This drawback is also a strength though, because surveys provide targeted answers to questions as a result. Now, as I said before, all research is intensive and demands a lot of resources. However, quantitative surveys are generally much less expensive than interviews. Given modern technology, surveys can be hosted online and shared with a very large number of potential respondents instantly. As a result, companies interested in consumer analytics can be much more efficient with resources in gathering quantitative data. The last benefit here goes along with that. With a defined budget, a company can get many more responses from a survey and from a much larger sample than they can from interviews and other qualitative approaches. Now, when doing market research and other kinds of study, a business would like to get as much actionable information from as many people as possible, making it easy to respond in really targeted ways, helping to achieve that. Now, as I said before, quantitative surveys typically use the Likert scale type questions and responses. Having consistently coded questions is important for clients to get better understandings of what the survey questions are aiming at. 
Now, assuming that the questions are well designed with the help of statistical consultants, this can help improve the survey validity and reliability as it increases the likelihood that all your respondents will understand and interpret the survey questions in the same way. And while we can help with both qualitative and quantitative research, the focus here in this video is on validation for a developed survey instrument. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the qualitative analysis, often called coding, that results from qualitative data collection, then check out our video on that in the academic consulting section of the website. Right, back to our quantitative instrument. Once you've finished writing the survey questions and their possible multiple choice responses, it's now time to test its validity and reliability. Now, in order to test for survey validity and reliability, a pilot test is often used. A pilot test is nothing more than an administration of the survey you designed to a relatively small sample. Since you need to make sure that your survey is valid and reliable before you deploy it for your research and analysis, you'll need to use a smaller group of people not included in that research. The statistical data from the pilot test is to be used exclusively for survey design and evaluation purposes, and not for the main goal of the survey, such as measuring customer satisfaction. Now, occasionally, additional survey questions can be incorporated in the pilot test to test whether some versions of a survey question is better than another, and to decide which one to keep. Now, in some more complex and longer surveys, the same question might even be asked more than once to check whether the respondent provides the same answer in both cases. In consulting with firms on these questions, now we've often recommended this. Outside of statistical testing, sometimes pilot tests include questions that directly ask respondents what they thought about the survey clarity, whether they thought it was too long or too short, and anything that might improve the final version of the survey. But the important thing to keep in mind about pilot tests is that they are all about designing the best survey possible. Once this process has been completed, the real data collection can begin. And in other words, the point of the pilot is to test the validity and reliability of the survey before it goes to the whole sample. Now, there's nothing worse than creating a survey, skipping the pilot test, and then finding out that the results are unreliable or invalid. And as a result, while it might be inconvenient, we always recommend working with a statistician to design a pilot study, even a small one, for all of our clients requiring survey development. Now let's discuss the actual tests used to access validity and reliability. With a full set of pilot test data in hand, attention can turn to running the statistical tests and procedures that allow us to analyze the extent to which the survey is valid and reliable. Let's start with reliability. Now, in academia, many types of reliability have been defined. These include inter-rater or inter-observer reliability, test-retest reliability, parallel forms reliability, and internal consistency reliability. Although all of these are important, typically the most attention is given to the last one, internal consistency reliability, and we'll discuss it in some detail. Internal consistency reliability measures how consistent are the results across an entire instrument or across predefined sections of that instrument. It's usually the case that instruments have more than one section. As such, the full instrument measuring one variable and portions of it measuring its several domains or subscales, for example, a job satisfaction survey, might comprise 40 survey questions. Question one through to eight could be designed to measure work-life balance. Question nine through to 16 could aim at measuring satisfaction with interaction with coworkers. Item 17 through to 24 could measure praise and recognition and so forth. In this example, these subscales would be said to show internal consistency reliability if all items within each scale tends to move along in the same direction as the others. Internal consistency reliability is usually measured with a metric called convex alpha. The formula for this metric is rather simple. As you can see from this formula, this coefficient tends to go up when rho, the correlation among the items, increases. This represents what I was explaining previously. We want items in the same domain to be highly correlated with each other, suggesting that they are measuring the same construct. 
In other words, Cronbach's alpha determines how effectively the instrument agrees with itself. In our data analytics work, we often encounter companies that struggle with this interpretation. Luckily, in the case of Cronbach's, the mathematical definition of this formula is conveniently designed so that the coefficient varies from 0 to 1, with higher values indicating higher reliability. Remember, however, to reverse score any survey questions in which that is applicable. Otherwise, the correlation coefficients, and thus Cronbach's alpha, will be incorrectly calculated. For example, consider three items measuring job satisfaction. All of them are rated from 1, meaning strongly disagree, to 5, meaning strongly agree. Items 1 and 2 are such that agreeing with them implies a higher degree of job satisfaction, but agreeing with item 3 would be related with a lower satisfaction. These items would be negatively correlated even if the scale is reliable. Therefore, responses from item 3 would need to be reverse scored before using Cronbach's alpha formula. As such, a score of 1 would become 5, a score of 2 would become 4, and so on. Now, after reverse scoring as appropriate, the Cronbach's alpha formula can be used normally. Again, working with a consultant to refine the statistics here can be very beneficial. Here we can see what makes a reliable instrument. Acceptable is a difficult place to get to, and ideally the instrument achieves good or excellent internal consistency reliability. Remember, you'll be putting a lot of stock into your results, so ensuring that they're clustered around that bullseye matters. Typically, standard psychometric surveys used in academia and clinical settings such as those measuring quality of life or mental health have Cronbach's alpha higher than 0.8 in all their domains. So let's summarize our discussion here. Now let's talk about validity. Like reliability, it comes in many forms. Also, just reliability, we're generally concerned with only some of them. Within this area, we have internal and external validity, convergent and divergent validity, construct validity, concurrent validity, face validity, and many others. Actually, one type of validity that we'll be concerned with is not generally tested at the statistical level. This is called face validity, and it needs to be done by hand, generally with two or more consultants who have done surveys in the particular subject previously. An assessment from these experts can determine whether on its face, and that's where it gets its name, the survey makes sense and measures what it sets out to. While there is no formal statistical analysis to determine face validity, it's an extremely important first step in survey design and requires a great deal of domain expertise to ensure that the survey is headed in the correct direction. The other main kind of validity that pilot studies attempt to determine is construct validity, that the questions come together to measure what they're intended to. Assessing this type of validity involves relatively complex statistical analysis procedures. These procedures are generally defined under the umbrella of Exploratory Factor Analysis, EFA, Confirmatory Factor Analysis, CFA, and Structural Equation Modeling, SEM. These statistical methods are somewhat difficult to apply, but we can help. While we would need several hours of consulting to discuss underlying mathematics of these procedures, I can give you an overview of what their goals are. EFA is typically used as a preliminary statistical analysis for cases in which you don't know how items within a survey can be grouped into subdomains or whether they should be put in subgroups at all. Now remember our previous example with a job satisfaction survey with items 1 through to 8 measuring work-life balance, items 9 through to 16 measuring satisfaction with co-workers and so on. When we are in the initial stages of survey design, it might not yet be clear which items measure what. And imagine an example with six items. Before collecting pilot data, we can't know which ones are related with what. Are items 1, 2 and 5 highly related? And then items 3, 4 and 6 are highly related amongst themselves, but maybe they're not with the other three items. Are maybe items 1 through to 5 highly related with 6 moving independently from all the others? Or are all 6 items highly related? 
EFA can give the answers to these questions. Through complex mathematical formulas, EFA examines the correlations among all items and determines an optimal separation of them, producing relatively few groups of items that are tightly coupled. These groups are called factors, and they form the basis of what might be the subdomains in the final version of the survey. In this example, the EFA results tell us that items 1 through to 3 measure one domain, while 4 through to 6 measure a different domain. EFA also produces for each item a value called a factor loading, which shows how strong the statistical relationship between an item and its factor is. These factor loadings can be especially useful to know in cases in which they are low, typically lower than 40%. Now, this would mean that the item is not strongly related to any factor. Generally, it is an indication that the item could be removed, or it was poorly worded and was unclear to respondents. In our consulting with businesses, we often work to navigate this complex process. Now, confirmatory factor analysis is a sort of second step after the exploratory one. In EFA, we allow the data to tell us what the structure of the factors is. In contrast, in CFA, as its name implies, we attempt to confirm through statistical analysis a factor structure that we hypothesize a priori. Suppose we have a customer satisfaction survey with six items, as in the previous example. We expect items 1 through to 3 to measure satisfaction with quality. We also expect items 4 through to 6 to measure satisfaction with delivery speed. And finally, we also expect both types of satisfaction to be somewhat related with each other, since they are both expressions of general customer satisfaction. We can therefore test this factor structure through CFA. Now, each of these arrows represents the relationship between the underlying factor we are interested in, such as satisfaction with product quality, with the survey items that we expect to be related with it. Analysis results from the CFA will tell us whether these relationships, which are also called factor loadings, are statistically significant. A factor loading that is not statistically significant suggests that the item we hypothesized to be related to the factor is not really related to it. And this is a warning sign, suggesting that the item could be removed or that it needs to be reworded, like we saw when we discussed EFA. CFA provides us several other pieces of interesting information. One of them is represented by this arrow. This is the relationship between both subdomains. In this example, it would tell us what is the implied relationship between satisfaction with quality and delivery speed. This is important information that could eventually be used to merge subdomains. For instance, the relationship might be very strong. Then, both hypothesized constructs might be measuring one and the same factor after all, and the survey could be simplified by dropping one or more subdomains, making it shorter, easier to complete, and therefore improving the response rate. Again, working through these complex statistics with a consultant can help to ensure your success of your instrument. Finally, CFA provides overall measure of goodness of fit, which gives us a general idea of how well the data matches our hypothesized factor structure. There are several such metrics, with the most commonly used ones being Comparative Fit Index, Tucker-Lewis Index, Root Mean Square Error of Approximation. These coefficients generally vary between 0 and 1, with higher values indicating that the hypothesized structure is correct. In contrast, poor value in these metrics indicate that there are problems with the survey. Now, there is a wide variety of possible issues that could be detected at this point. So, for instance, some items might load on a different factor than expected, or some pairs of items could be so highly correlated that one of them is redundant and could be removed. In any case, more advanced techniques need to be used to identify the problem and determine possible solutions. Survey design problems are extremely common, and they're the whole reason why pilot testing is needed before deploying a new survey. Now, I know all of this sounds like a lot of work, and it is indeed a lot of work to do even before we can start collecting data to analyze the phenomenon we're interested in, such as customer satisfaction. 
However, detecting survey problems in the early stages is extremely important to avoid disappointing results after investing large amounts of time and money into data collection. So please know that we're here to help. Survey development is a core area of expertise for us, and that includes both the initial item development and the pilot testing that follows and ensures that you have a valid and reliable instrument. Call us anytime and we'll be here to be your statistics consultant, craft a plan to meet your particular needs and help you achieve your business goals. Thanks for watching.